This is the Zowie XL2586X, and it isn't designed to do a lot of things. It's designed to do one thing. Push competitive shooters at 1080p and 540 hertz for the esports crowd, which it does really well. I do want to thank Zowie for sending this out, but I've got a couple thoughts right up front. Number one, the specific niche group of users that this monitor will service is incredibly small, especially at $1,000. I don't really think either of the monitors we're going to look at today are going to be a great fit for 90% of users, and I feel like I'm being generous. And two, I don't think I've ever reviewed a brand new product that potentially has such a short window of relevancy. With 480 hertz OLED coming in just the next few months, I would at bare minimum wait to see what those offerings look like before I considered a purchase. These just aren't versatile monitors. They're for a highly specific group of users who one, play exclusively competitive FPS and almost completely restricted to Valve, Overwatch, and CS. Two, have a rig capable of outputting those games at 540 FPS at 1080p. Yes, there are a couple benefits to running a 540 hertz monitor, even if your games can't hit 540 FPS. We'll talk about that more in a minute. And three, they play their best on a 24 inch monitor and just can't seem to perform as well on a 27 inch. Looking at a feature spec comparison, both these monitors can hit 540 hertz. Both screens measure just a hair over 24 inches. Both are TN panels. Both use DSC, which can be disabled on the Asus. The Zowie is limited to 8 bit. Asus can accept a 12 bit signal. The Zowie doesn't have HDR support. The Asus does. Zowie doesn't have any variable refresh rate support. Asus has an actual G-Sync module. Because of this, Zowie has fixed overdrive settings and Asus has variable overdrive. Asus has NVIDIA Reflex for latency testing, Zowie does not. Both panels have a backlight strobing tech, both have audio via headphone jack, Zowie has HDMI 2.1, Asus does not. Zowie has the S-Control puck for swapping presets on the fly and taking them with you, Asus does not. Zowie has flaps, Asus, no flaps. The stand has been redesigned for Zowie's newest models. The base here is probably the smallest I've seen yet. The design's pretty sleek overall. It's really smooth to adjust up and down. There's a bearing inside here. You get height, tilt, and swivel, but no pivot, so you cannot go full vertical on this stand. You can go full vertical on the Asus. There is still a carry handle on this new design. It's still functional, but it's not as sturdy. Your fingers don't pass all the way through, so they bottom out in this little hole. I don't feel as confident that I'm not going to drop it. The best change for me is that all the cables now plug straight into the back of the monitor like we see on LG panels. As somebody who swaps monitors a lot. I love this versus the vertical ports that you can never seem to see. The back looks pretty modern. I like it. The front, however, looks like 1997. These might be Zowie's fattest bezels yet. These look ridiculous. They have made some noticeable improvements this time around with the color handling. We're getting 100% coverage of sRGB and 96.1 of DCI-P3, so it feels and looks like it's operating in a wide gamut mode. It's better color coverage than the Asus and a pretty substantial improvement over the XL2566K. We still have the color vibrancy slider too that allows you to dial up the punchiness of the colors as you see fit. I like this. It's not accurate, it's fun, and I wish more monitors had this. The Asus doesn't. It ships in FPS1 mode, which is specifically for Counter-Strike, so the color is understandably not accurate in this mode. The most accurate results I could get with presets are in standard mode, and then set the gamma to four. Even then, it's just okay. And that's okay, because you're not buying a monitor like this to do content creation or provide a big cinema experience. It's not supposed to be super accurate. It's built for speed. Now, because this is an LCD panel and not an OLED, the first thing we have to do is figure out the best overdrive settings, which is called AMA in Zowie monitors. This is a balancing act, and we're looking for a sweet spot. What we want to do is drive the pixels hard enough to give us the lowest gray to gray response time, but not so hard that we have a lot of overshoot. That results in something that looks like this. This white halo around the image is called inverse ghosting. We do this by first measuring all the gray to gray transitions with an LDAT unit, and then to get a feel for motion blur and overshoot, I use a moving camera to track moving UFOs. This effectively simulates your eye tracking a moving object on the screen. Of the preset modes, off is too high for the gray to gray response. A high looks pretty good, and premium gives us inverse ghosting, so we know we don't want to go that far. Zowie monitors also have a 30 step custom mode where you can really dial this in, so I wind up running these tests a ton of times. And that's how we learned that the sweet spot for this monitor at 540 hertz is custom 20, where we can achieve a greater gray response time of 1.2 milliseconds. That sounds super fast, and it is, until you compare it to OLED, which now delivers a sub 0.1 millisecond pixel response. Now, motion blur is primarily affected by frame rate. You can definitely see how the motion blur increases as we run this panel at lower and lower frame rates. That is one big benefit 540 can give you, even if your game cannot output 540 FPS. The other benefit to higher hertz is lower 
lower input latency. At 540 hertz, the theoretical perfect input latency is only 0.9 milliseconds. This panel running without DIAC2 has a 1.1 millisecond input latency. This is tied with the ASUS 540. But we start to see that input latency or input lag increase when we start talking about DIAC2. This is Zowie's black magic backlight strobing method that tricks your eye into seeing less motion blur by turning off the backlight in between new frames. Even at 540 hertz, which already has great motion blur, it makes a noticeable difference. Check this out. It looks like a still frame, but it's not. When you enable DIAC2, you increase the input latency on this monitor to 2.3 milliseconds. Over on the ASUS side, there's a competing tech called ULMB2 that essentially achieves the same effect. The difference there is that ULMB2 is able to do this with no increase to latency. This backlight strobing tech has an effect on brightness too. Without it, this monitor manages a full screen brightness of just over 350 nits. Turning DIAC2 on high actually increases the brightness slightly and setting it to premium, which is where I'd personally run it, decreases the brightness by almost 20 nits. For context, 337 nits is still very bright, probably way brighter than you'd actually run this panel, so it's not really a factor. ULMB2 hits the brightness hard. The ASUS is brighter overall without it at 431 nits, but enabling ULMB2 takes you down to 318 nits. I usually run this even lower at 80%, lands me just under 260. Here is the difference between DIAC2 and ULMB2 at 540 hertz. I still gotta give it to ULMB for overall clarity, but at 540 hertz, it doesn't really matter. See, to get the best results from any backlight strobing technology, your game really needs to be outputting at the exact same frame rate as the hertz of your monitor in a perfect one-to-one -one ratio. All these UFO tests you see online are only valid to publish when the image is outputting at the same locked refresh rate of the monitor. So that means if your monitor is 540 hertz, then your game needs to be outputting at a locked 540 FPS to get the best results from backlight strobing. That's what the science says, and we've got motion blur captures to back it up. But the thing is, every single one of those pictures is one frame out of 540 that are happening every second. When you're playing at speeds like this, I find it basically impossible to tell whether backlight strobing is even on or not. At 240 hertz or even 360, DIAC and ULMB2 makes a noticeable difference, more so at 240. If I set this monitor to 240 hertz and run my game at 240 FPS locked, I can definitely tell when it's on or off. But at 540, it's a really small, like even imperceptible margin because the frames are already running so fast that motion blur is not really a factor anymore. I even tried some blind runs where I started a lobby without knowing if it was on or not and I could not reliably guess it. Having spent a few months now with 540 and making some upgrades to my machine, 540 does have a certain fluidity to it that you can't even really capture on camera. It's really fast, it's really smooth, it's really easy to locate and continue to track a target even when things are really chaotic because it doesn't feel like there's ever even a single blurry frame. I should mention too that DIAC2 is functional at least down to 120 hertz. On the ASUS side, ULMB2 only works between 360 hertz and 540. The other thing with ULMB2 is that you cannot run it and G-Sync at the same time. That's the good, and if you mainly play only competitive shooters, primarily Val or Overwatch 2, that's probably all you need to know. These monitors are currently the best way to experience those games, but that could change in as little as two to three months when 480 hertz OLED drops. The only caveat there being that the initial models will probably only be 27 inch, not 24. For everyone else, the trade-offs are simply too steep. If you enjoy competitive FPS, but still play other stuff, the Alienware 27 inch 360 hertz OLED is the way to go if you need something right now. Personally, I'm running the ASUS 32 inch 4K OLED because I can have my big 32 inch 4K experience when I want and then use aspect control to set it to a 24 inch window at any scaled resolution I want for competitive FPS. The only compromise being that it still only tops out at 240 hertz in this mode. But like I said, we still got 480 hertz on the way and I know you've got a lot of questions about that dual mode LG, so do I, but I haven't been able to get my hands on one yet. I hate to keep hitting on the same point here, but coming off an OLED, these monitors look washed. There's a noticeable lack of contrast. And even with the pixel density of a screen this small, 1080p is really obvious. It's not blurry, but it feels a little soft, like not sharp, especially if you have to really drop the quality settings to hit 540. I really wish somebody would do a 1440p high refresh rate at 24 inches. I really enjoy playing competitive at 24. Viewing angles on these are really poor too. If you're taller like me, even at a max stand height, you have to tilt this monitor up toward your face or it looks really weird. So for taller players, a monitor arm is highly recommended. If you're dead set on owning this format and you're trying to decide between the two, they really trade blows and honestly, there's no clear winner. For colors, I'll definitely give it to the Zowie. It just looks better to play on, but maybe not $100 better. They should probably reconsider their pricing for this monitor, at least make it neck and neck with the Asus. We're talking a $400 increase from the XL2566K to basically go from 360 to 540 and get a little more saturation to the colors. That's crazy. The Asus is a little more flexible in offering variable refresh rate, but if you're gonna be playing games on these monitors that need variable 
stable refresh rate, I would highly recommend you consider a different monitor for this kind of money. Asus does have HDR too, but HDR is ass on a TN panel. And while I think ULMB2 still takes it for quality, we are pixel peeping to a very high degree, and I just don't think it matters when you're playing this fast. That's my take. 540 hertz is fun. If you're in the very small market of people that prioritize speed over literally anything else, either one of these monitors are it for now. For everyone else, there's a lot better ways to spend this kind of money on a monitor. Catch you on the next one. Stay up.